Hello, Ira. Welcome to GMAX Studios. And it's an honor and pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. First question that everybody kind of wants to know is that where did photography start for you? Photography started for me while I was in high school. It was a hobby that just kept growing and growing and growing. I was supposed to eventually go to medical school and be a doctor, but I was so in love with taking photos that I decided follow my heart and be a photographer. I started working for a local newspaper and working with the local photographers that were older and knew what they were doing was what taught me everything. You are most you know, renowned for doing about 30 plus assignments for Nat Geo. So how did that happen? How does one actually land there first? Do they approach you or do you approach them? How does it work? I knew I wanted to travel and do that kind of photography around the world and I needed to approach the National Geographic, but you're not going to walk into the National Geographic and show them your pictures and impress them. They've seen great pictures from all around the world from great photographers. There's no way that you just walk in. I knew somebody that worked there that got my foot in the door and I went in and I suggested a story to them, a small story, and they were willing to try me out. Uh, what was that first small story that you did? Uh, the first small story I did was about uh, protecting and saving uh, the American buffalo, the bison, and because it, is, it had been uh, becoming extinct and they were the government was trying to breed these bison and you know populate the herd so that was the first story I did after that you have had some really really long uh, assignments which have lasted for days and months well after that yeah the assignments started coming in and back when I started we would do assignments that you know three four months at a time I'd be gone. And what, what, what's the longest time that you've spent on an assignment? There was one story I worked on for about a year and a half. It was a story I was doing on, on early man, the first modern human. So there was a lot of ground to cover, a lot of places to go, a lot of permissions to get. Okay. And that was predominantly shot in which country? I was shot around the world. I had been. I went to spend time in Africa. I spent time in Australia. I spent time in Israel. I spent. Uh, where else? I did some caves in France and Spain. So it was pretty much around the world. When you find something you love that you want to do. Those are the kind of things that are usually more difficult to get money at. If you want to go into banking or be an engineer, they're going to pay you. But if you want to be an artist, it's harder to find the money. And it's not only now, it's been that way when I started. Has it gotten tougher? I think it, I think it has gotten tougher because there are more people taking pictures there are more photos out there from people, so the value of a photo has dropped. Too many people with these great cameras traveling and taking pictures and willing 
to give them away just to get published. Publishers are going, why should I pay for it when I get it for free? So uh, being a cultural documentarian, do you think that a demand for that has uh, lessened? I think the demand for in-depth stories has lessened because the world is now attuned to social media, having you know instantaneous pictures, get it up, put it up on Facebook, put it up on Instagram, and serious in-depth photography is tougher to do. There aren't as many magazines as there used to be. So for me, book publishing is a way to display my photos, but even book publishing is tough. It's, my book just came out last week, a book on looking at the culture of Cuba through sport, baseball. They love the sport there. But it's tough getting a book published, and usually, if you're lucky enough to get it published, you don't necessarily make money at it. It's right. more of just for your heart. You want that book published. You want, you, know, you want to feel you've got something on paper. I'm living in a world of my images inside some computer screen. Getting prints and books published is special for me. But you have taken exceptionally well to social media, especially Instagram. So how, how, how did that happen? I mean, did it take a mental uh, kind of a leap of, uh, for you? The world in photography is totally changed. And not just photography, everything in the world has changed because of the digital age. And I realized I didn't want to be a dinosaur. I didn't want to be left behind dealing with my photography the way I did 20 years ago. So with social media and all the other digital platforms, I embraced it. I thought, okay, let's make this work for me. And I move forward. In my life, I don't want to look back on things. I want to look forward. I want to not, hey, this is what I used to do. It's more about, this is what I'm going to do. When I'm taking pictures now, I have to be careful because sometimes I do, it does cross my mind, wow, I want to shoot it and make it you know, the right size, the right feel for Instagram. But then I stop and I realize, well, if I get a really nice image, then it, I can't use it for something else. It's not the right style for something else. I can't, it's not going to make a print. I get torn at times. So uh, what was your typical gear like when you started shooting? You know, when I was shooting these science archaeological stories with film, I had to carry a lot of lights. I remember going through airports with 10, 12 cases of equipment, lighting equipment, backgrounds, all this grip gear, arms, reflectors. Uh, it was a lot of equipment. And now, using digital and being able to pump up the ISO to a higher number, I have to, you know, I, I can carry less light. So I've always used Profoto gear, and the new Profoto stuff is great. They have small lights that I could work with that are transportable, that are easy, and I'm able to carry less equipment, which is a blessing for me because. Those days of traveling with assistants and all this gear was, you know, always iffy getting the stuff on airplanes. So the switch from film to digital, uh, was it easy? Did you embrace it? Like you said, you embrace where the world is going. Do you feel nostalgic about it? I switched from film to digital, I think in about 2004, because that was a time when the cameras I thought were good enough. But when I first switched, I was nervous. And I remember one of the first stories I was doing, I, I had to go to uh, Malaysia to photograph. And I basically shot it digital, 
but I also shot it with film. That's how worried I was about it. So I shot it on two cameras. Right. And the initially, yeah, it's a little rough trying to f make sure things are working, developing a workflow. But as things progressed, I realized that digital was great. You know, I had multiple copies of my images. So if a drive went, they were backed up. I could email or send pictures around the world. Something with film I couldn't do. With film, you'd be worried about sending original transparencies out or getting dupes made of those transparencies and sending them FedEx somewhere and hoping they get there and then trying to get them back and worrying about them getting damaged. So with digital, it was when, once I got the rhythm, it was fantastic. No looking back. No, looking back, I do, what I do miss, and I hadn't done it in a long time, was working in black and white in the dark room. That stopped a long time ago, and maybe someday I'll give it a shot again, but you know, the dark room, black and white, making prints was pretty special. What's your um, typical kit now, now that you have switched to a mirrorless? How many lenses do you carry the world on your back? Or you just prefer going light and being agile on your feet? Well, now that you know, I'm using the mirrorless cameras and the so I'm using the Sonys, which are pretty small and they're lightweight, I try to carry less. So I carry typically two, maybe three bodies. I have usually three zooms with me, you know, a wide zoom, a mid-range zoom, and a long zoom. The Holy Trinity. Yeah, because with digital, you don't want to be changing lenses that much because of dust on the sensors. So besides those three basic zooms, I usually carry one or two fast prime lenses, 28 f2, 55, 18, or an 8518. Those would be for more night shots or really low light situations I get into. Back in the days of shooting film, I'd have and without zoom lenses, I'd have two or three cameras around my neck because you'd need the different lenses. With zooms, most of my stuff's done between 24 and 105 millimeters. I don't use extreme lenses unless I need an effect from the extreme lens, I'll use a long lens to blur out a background, or I'll use a really wide lens if I'm just in a room where there's no space to back off. Quick comparison, you went on a 30-day trip to the Arctic? Or oh, that was a three-month trip. Three-month trip, was yeah, it? Yeah, to okay. the Arctic when I was young and just starting out. Yeah, so compare this, what you're carrying now, to the kind of equipment that you carried then. What was that you were carrying then? Back then, I was using basic, probably, Nikon Fs or F2s. I had probably three bodies, maybe four with me. And there were no zooms then, so I, I had, I think, a 28 millimeter, 35, 50, 105, 200 millimeter lens. At one point, I had some 21 millimeter lens that you, could, you had to flip the mirror up, you put the lens in, and you had a separate viewfinder. And under those extreme circumstances, do you feel, you feel that, you know, I mean, you have the constant need to recharge batteries and, right, they didn't need recharging every day, definitely, so. Oh, when I was shooting film, especially when I was in the Arctic, nothing had batteries in there. Everything was, you know, battery-less. You know, I hand-wound my film. You couldn't put a motor on because in the cold weather, it would crack. And for a meter, I used a handheld selenium cell meter, so there are no batteries in that, one of the old ones with the little bulb in the front. Right. So, because in the cold weather, your batteries are gonna die. It was minus 40, minus 50 degrees. What do you think makes for a good composition? Well, to me, there are 
two different kind of compositions that generally work. The ones I like the best are layered compositions where I have something going on in the foreground, something going on in the middle ground, and then something going on in the background. And those layers really tell the story. But it's hard to do that. You've got to, it takes practice, it takes patience, waiting for things to sort of move in and create it. The other composition is the one where I think say wedding photographers and fashion photographers use where you've got your subject, you're using a long lens and a wide aperture and just let, let the background just go blurred. And those are easy to do, but I am personally happier with the more complex compositions. So that would mean shooting at high F values, right? To do those, yeah, I would, to get foreground, background, well, if it's daytime and there's a lot of light, it's not a problem to give you an F8. And usually I tend to shoot more with wider lenses anyway. I like 28 millimeters a really good spot for me. I know a lot of people like a 35 millimeter lens, but with 28, I get more of a spread in my background. It's personal choice. And so 28 millimeter lens at F8, you're gonna have a lot of depth of field. If you really want to be a good photographer, if you really love photography, you need to have personal projects because commission work, you can't be as creative. You're under the thumb. You're being told what to do by a client. Personal work is where all your creativity is and where you can try out new things, develop a new style. You're not worried about what's the client going to say. So I think personal work, personal projects are so important to do now. When I look at some of the newer photographers, the younger photographers today, I sometimes get the feeling they're not going to work as hard. I get this feeling that because of the digital images and because of what you could do in post-production, a lot of people think, oh, I don't have to get it right now, I'll just fix it later. Whereas I came from a generation of get it right in the camera. And for me, taking the picture, making the picture, being in the moment when that's happening is where I want to be. I don't want to be spending my time in front of the computer screen. That's not the joy of photography for me. For me, the joy of photography is being out there somewhere, hearing the sounds that are happening, smelling whatever is going on, the wind blowing, all that happening while I'm shooting. Those are the memories I want. That's where I want to be with my imagery, not at a computer in, in some post-production. Can you name three photographers have influenced your work or everybody should be aware of their work and look up to as idols, heroes in terms of work. I think every photographer looks up to different people. Different people have made an influence in their life. And there are classic photographers that have, Henri Cartier-Bresson is one of the classic photographers that everyone looks up to is reportage, his decisive moment, was an important changing point in the world of photography. When I started doing color, it was Ernst Haas, the German photographer, because he took color and he made imagery out of it, using color and as an art form of itself. And then there are some early Nat Geo photographers. There was a guy, Wynn Parks, uh, Bill Allard, a friend of mine, is a great photographer. So these are people that, you know, I look up to. You know, young photographers get so caught up in so many different things. I, I just want them to realize, keep your life simple. Try to keep your photography uncomplicated and follow your passion. 
hopefully if you follow the passion, you know, money will follow because you need money to continue your work. You need to survive. So unless you have another source of money, you can't be a photographer and be dirt poor. You need to buy equipment, you need your computers. So we, the most important thing is be happy in your photography. Because if people come to you and they see you're not such a happy person and you're miserable as a photographer because you're not shooting what you want, they're not gonna wanna hire you. So you've gotta have that attitude that you're happy with your photography, that you're doing what you want. And hopefully a little, little business sense and you may be able to survive. Being a wildlife for me, there is no new title or no new species for me. As a wildlife photographer, if you go on a tour or a safari, it starts at least 3-6 months before it starts. If you go to the blind knee or the jungle, it will be fun. And I will study and plan the photos that I will take out of it.